I'm Dr. Josh Reichard, Associate Faculty in the Forbes School of Business and Technology at the University of Arizona Global Campus, and this is the introductory video for CPT301, Computer Organization and Architecture. Let's begin by defining the topic of our course. What is computer organization and architecture? Put simply, computer organization and architecture comprises all of the work that engineers do to design everything from the CPU, the central processing unit of a computer, to its interfaces with memory, input and output, and so on and so forth. All of the components that make uh, any computer operate. In the history of computer organization and architecture, there are five classic components of a computer. There's input, what we feed into the computer, the keyboard or a mouse or some other device. Output, what the computer sends back to us as the user, so that's typically our display or a printer. Uh, memory, which is where computers store data temporarily or for the long term on uh, more permanent media like hard drives. There's the data path, which uh, is the processor's interface with uh, data that are stored in memory and the control path, which uh, is the processor's interface with uh, the other operations of uh, the computer that actually make the computer compute once it fetches data and instructions uh, from memory. So essentially, the data path plus control make up the processor or the CPU. If you take a look at the diagram on the right, you'll see uh, the whole square at the top comprises the computer. And uh, there's uh, control represented by uh, a little person with a megaphone and a script directing the operations. There's memory in the center, input and output on conveyor belts going off to the right. And there's a cycle uh, for the data path which flows through the processor. And this is a, a primitive but effective illustration of uh, the rudimentary aspects of computer organization and architecture. So you've probably heard of a CPU or a processor, which is the, the heart and brains of any computer. Processors fetch what are called instructions from memory, and it's the processor's job to decode those instructions, which are in the form of numbers, and when you get down to it, binary numbers, ones and zeros, Decoding them means uh, understanding what those ones and zeros mean and, and uh, what they're telling the CPU to do. And then, of course, the CPU has to execute those instructions. What's interesting is instructions and data all look the same. They all look like these numbers, ones and zeros in memory. But it's the CPU's job to process them accordingly and to know the difference between an instruction and data. And when the engineers design a CPU, they design it to do just that, to make that distinction and know what to execute and what to execute on. The second diagram to the right shows uh, the uh, fetch, decode, execute, and store cycle. And we'll be talking about this throughout the course, but essentially it's the processor's job to fetch instructions and data from memory, to decode them in the control unit, to execute them in what's called the ALU or the arithmetic logic unit, and then to store the results back to either what are called registers within the CPU, those are really fast storage areas, or back to general memory, and that's represented by RAM, uh, random access memory. It's memory that you can quickly read and write to on a computer, but when you turn it off, it disappears. So between these two diagrams, this should give you uh, a basic understanding of uh, what computer organization and architecture are all about. Now on the last slide, we gave a general overview which applies to nearly all computer architectures. But in this course, we're going to be studying the MIPS RISC processor specifically. And uh, MIPS is a company that's been producing uh, processors for decades. And RISC uh, stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And 
it's a very specific type of processor that has a small number of instructions that it can decode and execute. And you might ask, why are we studying a MIPS RISC processor instead of something more common that maybe people are more familiar with, like the Intel x86 line? Well, there are a couple of good reasons that we're studying the MIPS RISC processor in this course. First, RISC processors power most of our uh, modern mobile devices and embedded systems. So uh, the most common version that are in our uh, cell phones is an ARM processor, and that's a type of RISC processor. Um, but second, uh, RISC processors have the small number of instructions, which are actually manageable. It's just a few dozen instructions. So you could learn MIPS assembly language, and, and you'll be diving right into some of that in the first assignment in the course. Whereas with x86 architecture, there are somewhere around 1,500 different instructions. Now, what, what's interesting is uh, modern CISC processors, complex instruction set processors, uh, actually operate on what's called microcode. So they, they're, they're, they're really operating like a, a RISC processor but allow for uh, many, many, many more instructions. And that's to essentially make the uh, assembly language programming, uh, which gets compiled into machine code, uh, a little more manageable for uh, developers. But in the end, uh, the RISC processor has largely prevailed over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And finally, the MIPS RISC processor illustrates simple, single-issue, five-stage parallelism and pipelining, which we will talk about in detail further on in the course. Uh, but pipelining is essential to uh, modern processors, um, and many modern processors are also now uh, multi-core. So you have multiple processors running simultaneously, essentially within, within one. Uh, but, but pipelining is a fundamental concept that uh, has made uh, processors more efficient. And because of the simplicity of the MIPS processor, we can actually illustrate that in a tangible and easy to understand way. Interestingly, I'm going to show you a clip from uh, the film Hackers, and you'll see what uh, Angelina Jolie's character has to say about risk processors. Indeed. Risk architecture is going to change everything. Yeah, risk is good. So yes, risk is good. Next, let's talk about instructions and operations. We've mentioned those briefly, but let's look at them in more detail. So I've mentioned a couple of terms like machine code and assembly language. Um, what we'll be looking at specifically in this course is MIPS assembly language, which uh, is a low-level programming language that ultimately gets compiled into machine code, which are ones and zeros that the processor can understand. Uh, ultimately, as I said, instructions are represented as numbers, and as such, if we were just to look at memory, they would be indistinguishable from data unless we knew exactly uh, what the value was for each instruction. Uh, programs are often stored in alterable memory, though in older computers they were often stored in uh, ROM chips, so uh, in read-only chips, so that those were effectively permanent and, and gave the computer uh, a kernel or an operating system from which to, uh, to read when it boots. Uh, but if we look at memory, whether it's a ROM chip or, a, uh, or in RAM, we're going to see largely the same thing, a whole bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, the, if you think about a computer's language, the words that a computer uses are called instructions, and its vocabulary is called its instruction set. So for every processor, the, the basic thing that it has to do is to be able to perform simple arithmetic. So let's look at Ms. MIPS assembly language notation. This is the add instruction. So in this case, we're going to add the value in memory location B and the value in memory location C and store that result in memory location A. And in a higher level language like C or Java, 
we could just write out A equals B plus C. But in assembly, we have to specify the instruction and the operands which follow. Um, and together, the instruction and the operands make up uh, a single operation. So in this case, add A, B, C. In, in this example, the processor adds these two values, B and C, and puts their sum into A. Each MIPS instruction performs only one operation and must have exactly three operands. For example, suppose we want to sum four variables, B, C, D, and E, and store that result into variable A. The following sequence of instructions adds the four variables. So we'll do an add operation, B plus C, store the value in A. A plus D, store the value in A. A plus E, store the value in A. As you can see, it takes three instructions to sum the four variables. In a higher level language, this would be a lot easier and simpler. It would be expressed as A equals B plus C plus D plus E. But when we're operating at the processor level, it's going to take three discrete instructions in order to sum those four variables. I've mentioned that instructions like data are stored in the computer as a series of ones and zeros, and those are simply high and low electro electronic signals, uh, voltage levels, represented as numbers. Each piece of an instruction can be considered as an individual number, and placing these numbers side by side forms the instruction. We want to do something a little more complicated, as in this example, sum g plus h and subtract from that the sum of i plus j. Here are the instructions we would have to follow in MIPS assembly. And we would uh, follow much the same pattern as we did before, but as you can see, we now use the subtract instruction for the final operation. And there's some comments to the right showing you how that works. But once the assembly language program is compiled into machine code, we are no longer looking at instructions like this at all. We will end up looking at ones and zeros. So they will all look like binary data if we were to examine memory at any given time. So the processor expects to see an instruction. We also call these opcodes followed by the operands. And this is an, another example from MIPS assembly. This is to add an immediate value, meaning a static value, not necessarily something from a memory location, to another register and then store that in another register. Well, in memory, it just looks like this string of ones and zeros if we were to examine it down at the machine code level. And someone who knows MIPS assembly very well and has lots of time and patience could manually parse this out. It would be difficult, but it can be done, and many people reverse engineer things this way or make very, very low level edits to binary files in order to make tweaks and changes. Sometimes hackers do this even as a hobby, but in the end, it's the processor's job to know what those ones and zeros mean and operate accordingly. And ultimately, it was the engineers and the designers of that processor who are telling the machine what to do and how to interpret different numbers and values according to the opcodes and the instructions and the instruction set that those designers created. Since we're talking about binary numbers, it's important to provide some vocabulary that will be helpful to you throughout the rest of the course. Binary numbers in computers are generally divided into four categories. A bit is a single one or zero. It's either on or off. The voltage is either high or low. That's a bit. A nibble is four bits. A byte is eight bits. And in the case of the MIPS processor, a word is 32 bits or four bytes. So the MIPS processor is a 32-bit processor. And when we 
are speaking of binary we're talking about base 2 our typical number system is decimal meaning it's base 10 so each digit in a number that we represent is a tens place so we have the ones the tens the hundreds in binary it's 2 4 8 16 and so on and so forth so each digit is raised to the power of 2 and this diagram gives a, a good example of how uh, a word a byte and a nibble uh, can be organized I'll also note that in uh, binary representation we often talk about the least significant bit and the most significant bit the least significant bit is always on the right of a binary number because it's the lowest value uh, whereas the most significant bit is always on the left because it would be the the number raised to the highest power of 2 and that's much the same as it is with base 10 so if if you change uh, a digit in the ones place it's going to have a, a, a less of an effect on the overall number than if you change the digit in the millionths place for example and binary works much the same way let's talk about registers as I mentioned earlier registers are high-speed locations on the processor that can be used for very fast operations so the processor doesn't have to go out to memory and fetch values or necessarily right back to memory it can do some basic operations within uh, the processor itself so that those happen very very quickly so these are high-speed internal memory locations and often used to store temporary data and perform these very fast operations MIPS has a 32 by 32 bit register file used for such frequently accessed data and as we start looking at MIPS assembly you'll see there are some very specific purposes for blocks of those 32 uh, registers within the register file and when we get to looking at more sophisticated MIPS assembly code you'll see that there's a, a uh, syscall function and how you update certain registers determines what that syscall function does when you call it so you may be telling it to output text to the user's screen or to capture input and you can manipulate that by storing specific values within certain registers now these registers are numbered 0 to 31 uh, the zero register is always the value zero and that can actually be quite useful to always have that and and to be able to access it when needed and they're 32 bits wide because it's a 32-bit processor and a word in uh, MIPS architecture is 32 bits wide so uh, the registers t0 t1 all the way to t9 are for temporary values and s0 s1 through s7 are for saved variables and so on and so forth we will be talking about pipelining later in the course but I do want to introduce this to you early on because this is one of the main reasons why it makes sense to study the MIPS processor and risk architecture in general and I know oftentimes students always ask uh, why is this relevant why do I need to know this and uh, pipelining is one of the reasons why it's important to know this for your de degree major here at the University of Arizona Global Campus. On one of our first slides, I showed you a diagram of uh, the, the basic architecture of a computer and then a, a very rudimentary cycle that the processor engages in. Specifically in risk architecture, there are five stages instruction fetch instruction decode execute memory access and write back let's step through these instruction fetch is when the processor is ready to go out and get the next instruction from memory when this happens the processor updates a special register called the program counter and the program counter keeps track of where the processor is at in memory because as it's working through instructions the processor has to know where to go next and the program counter uh, tells the processor uh, where it's currently situated in memory so that it knows uh, where to go to fetch the next instruction 
The next stage is instruction decode. And this is once the processor has fetched the instruction, this is where the processor then translates the opcode into specific uh, control signals uh, and uh, then reads from relevant registers accordingly. This is now the processor uh, doing what it's told once it decodes the uh, instruction. And next is execute. So this may require the processor to perform an ALU operation. So this is an arithmetic logic unit. So that may be uh, an, an arithmetic function, add, subtract, multiply, divide, or it may be a logical operation uh, and or not, and so on and so forth, or a uh, jump or branch. And uh, if you have experience in some of the older programming languages like BASIC, this is much like a go-to. So this will allow the program counter to change its position, go somewhere else in memory, execute some code, and then return back, uh, much like a subroutine in higher level languages. And of course, processors accessing memory as needed, and uh, it may need to alter memory, it may need to get another value or multiple values from memory depending on the operands and then finally it writes back to the register file and updates any registers uh, based on the operation that it performed. These five stages operate in a rhythm and the rhythm is based on a specific frequency which is regulated by an oscillator in the computer called its clock and a clock is uh, in its simplest form, a crystal that vibrates and oscillates at a particular frequency, and that tells the processor how many instructions uh, per uh, second or per millisecond to execute, and it keeps the processor running at that rhythm. Uh, so the, in the illustrations on the right, you can see what used to be a, 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 a very manageable component of a, a crystal in ele electronic circuits. That would be a 16 megahertz crystal. And uh, you'll also see below that the uh, display of an oscilloscope showing uh, the relationship between voltage levels and time. And you see a typical sine wave there as that crystal is oscillating through time. As the clock ticks, the processor is uh, working through that five stage cycle of fetching, decoding, executing, and so on and so forth. We often hear about processor speed in terms of the frequency at which the clock is oscillating. So we hear about uh, a certain number of gigahertz, for example, that, that uh, a processor is operating at. But it's really not quite that simple. The speed of the computer is not solely based on its clock speed. Certainly the clock speed is important, but it's not the only factor. And as you'll see in some of our discussions and the early assignments in the course, we also measure uh, the speed of a computer based on its cycles per instruction. How many clock cycles does it take to execute a single instruction? That has uh, a large effect on how fast the processor can operate as well. So cycles per instruction or CPI is often more important and depends on how a chip's instruction set was designed by those engineers when they were laying out the architecture of, of the processor. Think of CPI as the average time it takes to complete an instruction, not just a single clock tick on a particular processor. And we'll do some exercises on calculating CPI in the first week of the course. Now that we've talked about the five stages of the fetch execute cycle and how a processor op oscillates at a specific frequency, we can now talk about pipelining. And we will discuss pipelining in much more detail in the later weeks of the course, but I want to introduce it to you because it's a good way to frame a lot of our discussions uh, throughout the course. Pipelining is simply the old idea of the assembly line. Henry Ford realized that he could produce many more automobiles by keeping that assembly line moving and having people doing one specific job over and over and again and 
and uh, keep the line moving so that uh, uh, maybe one person or one team is not uh, bogged down on doing one automobile at a time, but each person in their specialization is doing one part and the line keeps moving and keeps moving and keeps moving and many more uh, automobiles can be built that way. Well, a processor that is pipelined operates in a similar fashion. The processor will fetch the first instruction and while it's decoding the first instruction, it's going to go and fetch another one. And then while it's executing the first instruction, it's going to decode the second instruction and then go fetch a third instruction. While it's accessing memory for the first instruction, it's executing the second instruction, decoding the third instruction, and fetching a fourth instruction, and so on and so forth. And this chart gives a basic illustration of how that pipelining process would work. So as you can imagine, this does uh, create some efficiency in terms of how the processor operates. It also creates some problems because there are areas for potential conflict as it's doing that. But by and large, this was uh, quite a breakthrough in terms of uh, computer architecture and processor design. Later in the course, we'll talk about some other factors related to pipelining, like latency, throughput, and concurrency. But suffice it to say for now, this gives you a general overview of how pipelining works and uh, specifically what it looks like in the MIPS context. This is a more sophisticated illustration of what a pipelined MIPS processor looks like. And you can see uh, columns that divide certain sections of the CPU's architecture that represent specific parts of that cycle. So there's the instruction fetch and decode on the far left and the memory access and write back on the far right. We'll be engaging several iterations and versions of this diagram as we work through the course. Uh, I'll mention just a couple of things. You can see the register file there. You can see general memory. You can see the program counter, the arithmetic and logic unit, the ALU, uh, and it gives you an idea of how these components are all working together. As you design your, uh, throughout the, the uh, interactive assignments in the course, you'll be uh, you'll be designing concept maps and many of the concept maps will be to illustrate some of this architecture yourself. So this gives you a preview of some of the work that you'll be doing. To conclude, here are a couple of references and these are linked within the course itself and within my announcements so you'll have access to those including our course textbook. Ultimately, this is a challenging course and we're dealing with the nature of computers at their most fundamental levels. It can be intimidating, but I promise you it is achievable. And the course uh, is structured in such a way that if you do all of the discussions and the interactive assignments and you make an honest attempt on the weekly assignments, uh, you're not only going to get through the course, but you're going to learn a lot in the process. And you'll see that I'm the kind of instructor that cares about your success and is here to support you. So please, if you need anything, reach out to me via the Canvas inbox and I will be happy to help in any way that I can. Let's enjoy our next five weeks together.